gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into Your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful and so very thankful for the opportunity that You've given us to come together and feast upon Your Word. I so thank You, dear Father, for directing our steps, that You are sovereign in our lives, that apart from You, that we can do nothing. I just ask that You would Bless this study in Ruth. Filter out all the error, the foolishness, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the book of Ruth, a verse by verse. And in our last study, I believe that we were uh, somewhere quite along in the, in the, the first chapter uh, Ruth chapter 1. So I'd like to give a quick overview of what we've uh, looked at in the first video. Just a quick review. I'm persuaded that one of the primary purposes of the book of Ruth is to unite the family of Abraham and give us the genealogy of David, which is a beautiful picture of that which leads to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There was a man, a Lemelech, in Bethlehem, who, because of a famine, he took his family and he left. His two sons uh, married daughters in the land of Moab. A Lemelech died. The two sons died, and 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 we have and so we have three widows. In verse six, we read that uh, then she arose. Naomi arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab because she had heard that in the country of, uh, she had heard in the country while she was in Moab, she heard how the Lord had visited his people in giving bread. How any child of God cannot see in this book the direction and the sovereignty of God which I, I think is true in every passage of Scripture, astounds me. Ruth heard that the famine's over. We know by the end of the uh, uh, chapter that they arrived back in Bethlehem, the house of bread in the bar barley harvest. So the famine's over. And it's interesting that the famine drove them away from Bethlehem, and now food is, is bringing them back. I think it's important that we take note of that. It is God who controls famine. It is God who controls the harvest. We know that Israel is driven from the land. We know that Israel will be brought back by the direction of God. And I'm seeing Naomi here used as a picture of Israel. It is God who is bringing Naomi back because, in fact, forcing her back. Forcing her back. Because He's the one that controls the harvest. She's heard that the famine's over, and she's going to... She's headed back home. She doesn't have anything left in Moab. Her husband's dead. Her two sons are dead. In the land of Moab, there were no customs or laws which would support Naomi as, as there were back in her homeland. And this woman, she's in tough shape. She's a widow with two daughter-in-laws, that, and she's headed back home. And uh, she's... She's headed back home because she's heard of something that the Lord has done in verse 7. Therefore she went out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-laws went with her, and they went on their way to return unto the land of Judah. Now these three have left Moab, or at least they're on their way out of Moab, and the question always arises, why is it that they're on the road before Naomi begins to urge these two girls to go back home? 
I mean, why didn't she say that before, you know, before they packed their bags and loaded them on the stage and headed out of Moab? And I'm going to suggest that, first of all, if Naomi had, had left alone, well, there would be no point to the story. So again, we see the sovereignty of God. And folks, I find that amazing. You could look at their journey back to Bethlehem as, as Redemption Road. Just call it Redemption Road. Orpah's name is also said to mean, and I pointed this out, double-minded, stubborn, which to me perfectly describes our situation when the crisis demanded a decision. Should she, like Ruth, go on to Bethlehem with Naomi or return alone to Moab? And James reminds us, in the book of James, we, we, we know, if you're familiar at all with the book of James, he reminds us that a double-minded person is unstable in all his ways. Orpah is derived from a Hebrew word for neck, and therefore means stiff-necked or stubborn. She turns back to Moab. But Ruth follows Naomi. Your God shall be my God. Your people shall be my people, she says. So Orpah turns back to her pagan gods. If Naomi had left alone, we wouldn't be seeing this. We wouldn't be seeing the picture that God wanted us to see. But here's what I hope that you'll see. Don't credit Ruth. Do not credit Ruth. Don't criticize Orpah. By God's grace and God's grace alone, we are all like Ruth. Apart from God's grace, we are Orpah. So Orpah did what only she could do while Ruth did what only Ruth could do unless you consider God a powerless bystander. You know, where the will of the, of the Creator can be overridden by the will of the creature. So Orpah goes her way, and she vanishes from the pages of sacred history. The sovereign decree of God was enacted on that Bethlehem road. One of His own went forward to abundant life, and the other retreated into darkness and despair. We see the same thing in the crucifixion of Christ. One thief went to paradise, the other to perdition. So they're on their way. And on their way, verse 8, Naomi says to her, her, her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. Now that kind of seems strange. Why is it the mother's house and not the father's house? And there are those who suggest that in the land of Moab, this was the custom, and that in the land of Israel, it would have been the father's house. I'm sure the Holy Spirit has a definite reason in telling us that Naomi told them to go and return to their mother's house. I'm going to suggest that that's the place of comfort for these two girls. And so what Naomi is saying to them is that where she's going, there is no comfort for them. There's no hope. And so they should return to their mother's house. And the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. We see that she is happy with the way that they treated her, the way that they treated her two boys, and, ha and how that they lived with them that they had dealt very kindly with them and with her as a widow. Apparently, they had been supportive of Naomi when their husbands died. It's interesting to me that Naomi says, the Lord deal kindly with you. And folks, I have to conclude that Naomi recognizes the power and the control of God and yet and yet all through this chapter, all through the first chapter, she's bitter. Right to the very end of the chapter. She's bitter. She will say that my name isn't lovely, my name is bitter, and God hasn't done anything nice for me. God's hand, in fact, she says, is against me. And folks, I'll eat my hat 
if that's not the position of a lot of Christians today. Naomi is doing what I think most of us are tempted to do, which is interpret God by our circumstances, when what we ought to be doing is interpreting our circumstances by God. And that's Naomi's big problem here. She looks at all that has happened to her, and though she admits God is, is, is in control, she's bitter. Her argument is that God has not dealt kindly with her. And we see that uh, two or three times in this chapter. And so she says in verse 8, the Lord deal kindly with you. He sure didn't with me. Now folks, I don't mean to make light of Naomi having gone through some intense sorrow. She's lost her husband. She's lost both her sons. The Lord uh, didn't deal kindly with me. She says, I, I hope He does with you. The Lord grant you that you may find rest. As if to infer, I, I haven't found rest. I, I'll never find rest. I don't have rest. That you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. So she's sending them back to their family, the house of her husband. I, I'm convinced that she's referring to Moab by that phrase. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voice and wept. She's telling them to go back. There won't be any rest with her, but it may be that the Lord will allow you to find rest in Moab. But that's not where rest is going to be, going to ultimately be found. This is Naomi's and ours, our human perspective on it all. And in her sorrow, she's done what I think many, many Christians have done, which is try to view her circumstances in order to understand God. Rather, rather than, than use God to, to understand her circumstances. Why can't God do with Naomi as He pleases? If she belongs to Him. It seems that in the text, this theme is going to underwrite all the rest of this chapter. You know, poor me, God hasn't played fair with me. If you believe that God doesn't love you, and that He takes great pleasure out of your suffering and your difficulty, then you have a non-scriptural view of God. We know and believe God is in control and it's, and it's really not God's fault, but, but, but you don't see Naomi saying that. I don't see from any of these verses that Naomi thinks God's out of control, yet she doesn't think God has dealt fairly with her. I am positive Naomi will realize in heaven that God used her in a mighty way so that David could reign over his people, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm certain that that will be each of our positions. The human emotional response is that, well, you know, Stephen shouldn't have been stoned when he's young and Peter lived to be old. That's just not fair. You know, folks, I don't know why God does what he does. One thing I do know is that God loves us and He deals with us based on these truths. I need to look at what happens to me through the lens of God's Word and who God is and how He's working in my life, not trying to find Him or interpret Him by what happens in my life. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. The language is very strong in verse 9. This is, this is real deep emotion. Apparently, these girls did not want to leave. They didn't, they didn't want this breakup. So they said to Naomi, We will return with you to your people. Naomi's trying to get them to go back to their people. They say, Absolutely not. We're going to go with you to your people. And now Naomi uses some arguments which to her make sense from the human standpoint. Why go with me? I mean, what hope is there? There are no more sons in my womb. The word womb there is not the normal Hebrew word for womb. There are no more sons in my body that they may be your husband. So Naomi is telling them that there isn't any hope there. 
then she's referring to, to Levite marriage. If she had one child who was a boy, I mean, what's she going to do? I mean, is she going to flip a coin, you know, to see which, see which one uh, uh, gets to marry, you know, the boy? What she's saying is, if you're familiar with the custom back in Israel, I don't have any kids. And she's even more blunt. Turn again, my daughters, and go your way. Leave me alone. I'm too old to have a husband. Well, she's not too old to get married. She's too old to conceive. That's what she said. It isn't that she couldn't have a husband. What she's saying to these kids is, not only are there uh, not any more sons in my body, but even if I did marry, I couldn't have a kid. It's too late in life. That's what she's saying. She's not too old to have a husband, but she's too old to conceive. And note that it says sons, plural. Plural. Some suggest that what she's saying is twins. I mean, man, I'm really, I'm, I'm really blowing this up for you. I can't conceive even if I had a husband, but if I could, and, and even if I could, could have, even if I could have twins, are you going to wait for them to grow up? I don't know how old they were, but let's assume that they married at oh, like around 15. Well, they lived for 10. They lived for 10 years with their husbands. Well, that's 25. Seems to me as young as you can make them. So, if they waited on those sons to be grown, they're going to be 40, 45. They're about somewhere like that, something like that. Are you going to wait for them until they're fully grown? Would you stay for them from having husbands? You know, if you had an opportunity to marry, you know, some John Wayne or, or, or Clark Gable or, you know, or somebody, are you, are you going to give that up waiting for these kids to grow up? That's what that says. Are you going to give up the chance to get married just to wait for these kids that I can't have? No, come on, that's ridiculous. For it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. Naomi's bitter. This won't be the last time that Naomi complains that God has dealt unfairly with her. I don't want, I don't want God to deal with you like God has dealt with me, is what I, I see basic, her basically saying. So I stress again, I don't want you to miss the point that Naomi is doing what multiplied thousands of Christians do that is, they try to understand God by what happens to them rather than trying to understand what happens to them by God. To know a God who, that, who loves you with an everlasting love that, that whatever He does in your life, no matter how painful, no matter how difficult it is, it's done for a good pur purpose. It's, it's a Romans 8.28 thing. God works all things together for the good. I imagine that Naomi's now saying, you know, man, if I had only knew what God was doing, you know, I wouldn't have been so bitter. And folks, God hasn't concealed that truth from you. He's told you that victory is assured, that He always causes us to triumph, that He knows that the way that you take, that, he's, that He sustains you, that He upholds you. Naomi is, is surely characteristic of Israel here. So far, we've seen God dealing with a mighty, mighty purpose in mind. Before we're through with the book, it's not only Ruth who has a romantic and happy marriage with Boaz. I think the language of the book gives us every right to conclude that the first child is given to Naomi. Her child is given to her. God had a marvelous plan. I think that's one of the, the great purposes of this first chapter to realize. So, you know, what looks like utter devastation is for Naomi, ordained by God, to fulfill a grand purpose. You do see that, right? Yet she says the Lord is against me. What a terrible thing to say. Folks, God is never against you. God's, He's not your enemy. He's never been your enemy. He redeemed you. He has a purpose in your life. 
the greatest lessons that we learn are the ones that He teaches us in difficulty and in times of suffering. Dearly beloved, I pray that you find comfort in that truth. And I want you to take note of the fact that her complaint seems to be against God. Not any mistakes that her husband might have made. You know, it's more natural, I think, for a woman to say, you know, the dumb idiot. You know, he, had, he, he just had to go and leave Bethlehem just because there was a little bit of famine, you know, and he got us in all this trouble. You know, if we had just stayed home, you know, the family would have been there. You know, you know, medical services are better in Bethlehem than they ever were in, in Moab. Man, she could have just gone on and on and on, but she didn't. And now she's arguing with these two girls that God has dealt harshly with her. And if they stay with her, they, they just might be the recipients of that same treatment. These two girls were Moabites. They worshiped the gods of Moab. They were idolatrous practices. They were as foreign to what Naomi was used to as anyone can possibly imagine. You see, the problem with the book of Ruth, to me, is a, a typical problem in the Word of God and, and in our experiences. The human mind is so eager to put man on top and God on the bottom. And what a beautiful picture of human responsibility, somebody says. Are, are we, seriously, are we really, listen folks, are we really going to give credit to Ruth for her decision and criticize Orpah for hers, giving, given what we know from other verses of Scripture? Orpah, listen, Orpah appears to be making the most logical decision. Ruth appears to be making the most unreasonable decision, given that she is from Moab as well. I have to believe that the decision was made by God, folks. I mean, let's reverse this, okay? You know, what would it take for you to leave the Christian community in which you were raised? You know, the faith that you have in the Lord to go to, you know, say, Iran or Saudi Arabia. Dearly beloved, listen to me. This is not a beautiful picture of a human faced with a choice. That's not the picture. You know, one who has free will and can decide to go one way or the other. Nobody of their own free accord would make the decision Ruth made. And please, please don't say to me, you know, well, it doesn't matter what any other verses of Scripture says. You know, what we're looking at in this one is they made a choice. They each made their choice. Now, you have no right to build your theology on one verse. Let, let's assume that this is a picture of human responsibility. And Ruth is faced with a choice, and she makes the right one, and Orpah makes the wrong one. If that's what this is a picture of, then where is the Scripture that would support that? If you take that position, you take that position in the face of verses like, No man can come unto me except my Father which is in heaven compel him. Drag him, literally, drag him. You would have an immense body of Scripture that said, you know, wait a minute, you've made the wrong application out of this passage of Scripture. Ruth's choice, folks, is a picture of God's sovereign, compelling direction, election, because it's not the choice that a normal human would make. And that's always true of those who come to Christ. We see the picture of the Jews with all of the evidence that, that Jesus was the Messiah. From Adam to the book of Revelation, you see that that whenever man does make a choice that is not compelled by God, it's not a good choice. So we now see that Orpah kissed Naomi goodbye. The Hebrew word reveals that she said goodbye. A one-way kiss, man, I'm out of here. But Ruth clave unto her, and, and she said... Uh, 
And then in verse 15, Naomi said to Ruth in verse 15, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Now, I think it's easy for you, know, for you who know and love the Lord to say, wow, nobody in their right mind would go back to these idols. Nobody in their right mind would go back to that worship system that existed in Moab. It's easy for you to say that. So you say, I understand Ruth's decision. You know, I wouldn't do it either. But apart from the grace of God, you would have. I would have. Ruth was a Moabite. Ruth grew up and lived in that experience. The natural thing for her to do would be to go back to her gods. No one turns away from their idols to Christ if God doesn't compel them to. And yet Christians say, you know, look at what Ruth did. She did the right thing, and Orpah, well, she's going back to where she shouldn't be. When what Orpah did was go back to her people where she belongs, she's, she's going back to her pagan gods. She, she could have followed Ruth and Naomi. You know, that's, that's what God wished that she had done. And man, I, I'm gonna, folks, it pains my tongue to even say those words. God wished that that's what she had done? If I tell you people that, I have stripped God completely of His sovereign will and choice. I have robbed Him of that. In fact, I've destroyed grace by saying that. I will not say that. I refuse to say that. What would compel this young lady to say, I'll go where you go. I'll live where you live. I'll become part of your people, and your God's going to be my God. One word. Grace. If you want to make that some marvelous choice where that, you know Ruth gets all the glory and God gets none, I mean, you're free to do that, but you will have an entire body of Scripture that says you've made the wrong application out of this verse. The application I want you to see in this verse is is that Ruth belongs to God. And He chose her. He chose her out of the land of idolatry. He chose her out of the land of evil and He brought her to Himself. And in that case, Ruth is viewed as a beautiful, beautiful picture of the Gentiles that will be joined to Israel in the body of Christ. They're going to be grafted in. She's a beautiful picture of the Gentiles coming to the Lord. But, and here's where I differ with most commentators, she is also, in my opinion, a picture of the remnant of Israel that God has determined to redeem as well as those who are saved out of the tribulation period after the church has been removed. In fact, I believe Ruth represents, here it is, redeemed humanity as a whole in its entirety and we members of the body of Christ we are included in that remnant just as messianic Jews are today as as will be tribulation period saints in the near future and I'd even go as far as to say that that would include Jews and Gentiles redeemed before the church began I believe it to be a beautiful picture of God's sovereign power and grace and redemption. There's an awful lot of preaching that's upsetting to Christians. What this book does is bring peace to our hearts. It comforts us. It encourages us. Verse 19. So the, the two went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came to pass when they had come to Bethlehem, that all of the city, all of the city was moved about them. And they said, is this Naomi? And she said unto them, call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi? seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. 
So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning, it's, that's, that was when it was, the beginning of the barley harvest. We have an amazing verse in verse 19. We have them traveling in unity, and they stayed together in unity. They traveled together in unity. Well, are we as believers in Christ on our way to glory in unity? Yes, we are. And they stayed together in unity until they came to the house of bread, Bethlehem. And when they got there, the whole city, the entire city was moved. All the city, says the Hebrew. I mean, that's a very mild translation of the Hebrew. It would not be pushing the text, the word in the text, to say that the city was wildly excited about it. They, they, the city folks made an uproar, okay, is what the Hebrew is saying. Naomi's back. There's been all kinds of conjectures on why the city was so excited. I believe that the type for us is that when the Lord Jesus Christ does bring His own back to the land, there will be a lot of excitement. In fact, there's rejoicing when a soul is saved, when a soul is redeemed, when one of God's children is brought back. There will be rejoicing when we finally get to glory. So I think that's the picture that we're seeing there. So they were thrilled to see her. And Naomi said, don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. And once again, the picture is that she sees God dealing bitterly, unfairly with her. No awareness of what God had done to get Ruth out of Moab and to bring them back into the land. What does Naomi think today? In, in, in reading the last chapter of this book of Ruth and seeing the lineage that comes from Boaz to David, you know, and through David to Christ, for Naomi to say, wow, you know, what a privilege that God shows me to be a part and a parcel of this important program that led to the Messiah. But she doesn't see that here. Think of what he's doing in your life, folks. You know, just like Stephen could argue, you know, that it was unfair that he died at, at an early age when Peter and Paul lived to be old. When, you know, when God used, in fact, well, I believe God used Stephen to touch the heart of Paul who penned 13 of the New Testament books through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. What a marvelous privilege to be used of God Almighty, to know that we're being used of God Almighty. Oh, and Steve, I'm not, I know you may be, he may be using you, but he's not using me. I beg to differ. In fact, I'm absolutely persuaded that that is true of every single one of us folks. I want you to see that. I want you to know that. I don't know whose life He touches through your experiences, but we have a wealth of Scripture that says that this is not some disjointed exercise. This is not some experiment on the part of God that just that might, be, might go wrong. This isn't something that He's toying with, and this isn't something that He's doing other than in love. And here's Naomi saying that God has dealt bitterly with her and that she's no longer pleasant when in actual truth God has used Naomi and her, and her husband Elimelech and her boys in a marvelous way to show His grace in bringing one out of Moab to become named in the lineage of Christ. The human response would be, you know, we're looking at a special people here, you know, exceptional people. But folks, there's no grace in that. God, is, He's teaching us that He's a God of grace, a God of love, and a God of compassion. He didn't need Ruth in the line of Christ. He didn't need Rahab in the line of Christ. He didn't need Bathsheba. God did what He did 
as a lesson for us on grace. I believe God's focus is always on us, not Himself. Our focus is, is the reverse. Our focus is on God, not self. But I believe God's focus is on us, not Himself. That's what I believe. He loves you folks. He loves every one of you. Note what the text is saying. Naomi is saying that God's sovereignty drove her back and He brought me home empty. Well, what He did was bring her home full. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the bar barley harvest. They left in a famine. They came back to plenty. I think that's the most powerful verse of this whole first chapter. They left in a famine. They came back to plenty. This is a verse that clinches, I believe, all that I've said about the sovereign grace of God. It's God that directed that. It's, so Naomi returned. That's the only verb we need in the sentence structure. But it doesn't just say Naomi returned. The words say Naomi came back home and Ruth came back home. Everybody's Bible says Naomi came back home and Ruth the Moabitess uh, or daughter-in-law came back home out of the land, the Moab, Moab. Naomi, the Hebrew says, is back where she belongs. Ruth is back where she belongs. So now Ruth is where she belongs. This verse is very similar to the one in, in Peter that we return to the bishop and shepherd of our souls. You are back where you belong. Like Elimelech. Think about, listen. Elimelech. Let's go back to Elimelech here for just a moment. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We see in Romans chapter 6, what fruit did you reap at, at that time? from the things of which you are now ashamed, the outcome of those things is death. The chapter closes with a whole city being ecstatic, to put it, to put it mildly, to see Naomi and Ruth return. Like in the case of the prodigal son, there is great rejoicing when God's people return to where they belong. Well, I'm running out of time here. We are God's people and the Holy Spirit is telling us that God chose Ruth. She was always His when she was in Moab. The human mind would say that she was, she was where she belonged in Moab. God said that's not where she belonged. She belonged in Bethlehem by the grace and the sovereign power of God. She's back where she belongs. And that's true of every one of, of you, as well as those outside the family and household of God today. Famine drove us all out. Plenty brought us all back. The bread of life. He made us new creations in Christ. He forced us back to Himself by grace, folks, so that we've returned where we belong after leaving for a land that He had cursed which brought forth nothing but death. God loves us with an everlasting love. In fact, His love is so great, God is using us in ways that we could never imagine. Well, I'm totally out of time. Thank you all for listening. Lord bless you as you go forward in your walk with Christ. Stay safe out there. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.